This may look like a sunny day on your average Maryland grain farm, but there's more than dirt between these rows of corn. Michelle Cavagelli is a scientist at the largest agricultural research facility in the world. Right now, he's taking gas samples for one of their studies. 10 milliliters, I take it, put it in one of my vials, and that, then I can analyze back in the lab for the amount of nitrous oxide, one of the key greenhouse gases. Welcome to the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, the largest in-house research facility within the USDA's Ag Research Service. It's called BARC for short. It's about uh, 7,000 acres of a working research farm located outside of Washington, D.C. We have 18 laboratories that conduct ag research from field work to animal science, plant science, and natural resources. Even if you haven't heard of the Ag Research Service, you probably know their work. In fact, chances are you've eaten it. Hybridized corn, commercial blueberries, and instant mashed potatoes all owe their existence to ARS scientists. Anytime you eat, you're already benefiting from science. Everything you see as you drive by a farm, all this corn that you see here, is full of science in the past. To keep meeting the needs of the future, we need to invest in additional research. And the needs of the future are daunting. The global population is growing, fast, with an estimated 74 million new mouths to feed every year. Some estimates are that by 2050, we need to double food production on the planet. At the same time, we need to reduce the environmental impact. And at the same time, we're dealing with climate change. So we're in an unprecedented situation in global food production. At Bark, science isn't confined to the lab. It happens right here in the great outdoors. You have to have the field. You have to have the soil. You have to have the climate. You have to have the weather changes to understand how the species, how the organism does in the, in the real world. Today, Michelle is studying the long-term effects of farming methods on crop yields, economics, and the environment. The project began in 1996. It's a unique living laboratory because there's not many sites where the same thing has been done the same way for a long term so that we can understand how long term changes occur. To do so, he takes measurements of pretty much everything. So we'll look at soil samples, plant tissue samples, we'll look at the growth rates of the plants in this system, as well as a whole range of other factors that contribute to a kind of environmental metrics. But for now, soil samples. And taking soil samples is harder work than you might think. It's very dry. <laughs> but there we go. The samples are collected and brought back to the lab. And then it's time to really get down to business. Or should I say, science. So we take these soil samples from the field, and then we bring them into the lab, and then we extract them uh, for various different nutrients we're targeting, in this case, nitrogen. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus help plants grow, but they also have environmental consequences. In the Chesapeake Bay, runoff containing nitrogen and phosphorus causes algae blooms that steal oxygen from the bay's wildlife. There's a lot of impetus to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus losses, perhaps in Maryland more than almost any other state. And so we focus a lot of our energy then on trying to understand how we can tighten the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. But Bark's research doesn't just apply to Maryland. Many of its findings are applicable to farmers worldwide and to the farmers of the future. And anything that affects future farmers affects us all. We need to continue to be developing cropping systems that are not only sustainable, but are productive to have food for our children's children's children.